Hey everyone, welcome to the seventh consecutive day that we're doing YouTube live. I can't believe we're doing seven days. Um, and nobody believed that we, we do this. And also big thanks to Atil and Putika who commented on our videos and gave us the motivation to keep going. Um, Siddharth will stop doing those stupid faces if more people comment. Uh, so yeah, thanks for uh, watching the videos and we're very happy we're continuing to do this. Okay. On the seventh day, today we're going to be discussing cloud kitchens. Uh, so Siddharth, let's kick it off. What are cloud kitchens? Yeah. So, I mean, these are kitchens in the cloud. Sorry. Um, so basically these are kitchens that don't have an uh, a seating. So it's just kitchens that are delivery only or ghost kitchens, are, they're often called, right? So you'll have a kitchen somewhere and the only way you can place an order and eat from here is by using one of the delivery apps or directly placing an order with them um, through their website or through their app if they have one. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's basically the concept. The idea really is, can you save up on the rent that you have to pay um, in all these posh locations where these restaurants are generally, and then just focus on uh, delivery only and hence make a bigger profit. At least that's the thesis. We'll end up discussing on, on if that works out or not. Yeah, um, I think what you're saying is totally right that all of these cloud kitchens started because all these um, apps started really taking off and more and more people wanted to join the apps and you know sell their food on the apps. But they didn't, uh, they realized that they didn't need to set up the whole front end. They could just set up the back end, set up the kitchen, uh, make a menu and they could start selling and they could save so much on rent because usually about 30% of a restaurant's uh, revenue goes towards rent. So you're saving all of that but there's a catch to that. We'll get to that later, what the catch is. Um, so yeah, so why did these cloud kitchens start? Uh, I already told you one reason why. And you know, online food delivery is really booming. It was already booming in 2019. In 2020, it went crazy because of COVID and it's only growing even more in 2021. Um, and usually also in the old style traditional restaurants, you were limited to only one cuisine per restaurant. Like you could only do Lebanese, you could only do Indian, you could only do Japanese. But with these cloud kitchens, you can make whatever you want in the back end because nobody knows uh, which brand is cooking at what rest, uh, at what kitchen. Yeah. So, so just to just to clarify on that one, right? there are multi cuisine restaurants. But what ends up happening is you don't sort of look at them as as specialized into something. Yeah. The cloud kitchens, you can basically sit out of one kitchen. It technically is the same multi-cuisine kitchen, but you can have different brands online without you realizing that it's coming out of the same kitchen. Yeah. And one, one big thing that I think is a big advantage of cloud kitchens is you can experiment a lot more because the upfront cost of setting it up is so much lower uh, because you don't have to do the interiors or any of that, right? Interiors is very expensive for restaurants. So you can experiment a lot more. You can do, you can experiment with Ethiopian food. Then you can experiment with Lebanese the next day or whatever. Uh, so you can experiment a lot more, which is one thing I really like about the cloud kitchen model. And the last thing that I want to say is that in a normal restaurant, the amount that you can sell is limited by the physical space that you have, by the number of people that you can sit in that space. With a cloud kitchen, that's no longer true. You're only limited by how much you can cook and um, being a, since you're saving on rent, you can rent a much larger kitchen and you can sell a lot more. Um, so Siddharth, uh, what's like, who are, who are the people that are really doing well in the entire cloud kitchen arena in India right now? The biggest player in this space right now is Rebel Foods. Uh, not a lot of people might have heard of the name Rebel Foods, but if you know Faso's, if you know Barrow's Biryani, and a bunch of other brands, all of them are backed by Rebel Foods, right? Um, they originally started out with like a cloud kitchen slide hybrid model where it was small shops where three or four people could sit, but they eventually realized that that cost, fixed cost of like rental and all of that made absolutely no sense. And they went completely um, cloud at that point in time. Um, I think they've raised about $350 million in funding so far. They are by far the biggest players. Then there are players like and, Fresh Menu. And they're possibly, they're possibly one of the biggest players for cloud kitchens in the world, not yes. just in India. Yeah. Uh, they have a ton of um, cloud kitchens across India. And in fact, the, the very, very large um, American fast food chain, Wendy's, when it came to India, instead of opening up physical locations in India, Wendy's was just like, I'm not going to do that. They just did a tie-in with uh, Rebel Foods 
and uh, rebel foods just makes all the food for wendy's and um, yeah wendy's has now entered india and now they're selling through swiggy and zomato yes simple yeah anyway. um so box 8 is another company inner chef fresh menu a uh, bunch of these players have raised a lot of money chaios chaios i i mean chaios also has a uh, a fixed sort of uh, place where they where they do but they also have like cloud kitchen models yeah. now yeah um and sri and zomato actually interestingly also tried this experiment themselves where they said we are going to set up cloud kitchens for one their own brands so swiggy has their own sort of bra- in 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 house brands but they also said for other people to just come in and use the facility and start selling we're going to give you this facility where you can just plug and play of sorts and we're going to talk about how that's an opportunity in itself just providing infrastructure to these cloud kitchen players yeah. um the entire process of setting up a cloud kitchen we've like detailed that entire thing out in the newsletter that's going to be in the comment so check that out if you're interested in in what it takes to set up one uh but let's talk about some of the predictions and opportunity sail on what's going to happen in this space where what are your thoughts okay so i see three main parts of the entire value chain for cloud kitchens you have the the actual making of the food which is the actual cloud kitchen then you have the technology stack uh which means the software that is assisting you uh running your entire kitchen and thirdly you have the food aggregator right the third step food aggregator it's already done right zomato and swiggy have already taken over that market i don't think you can really do much uh in the, in in the food aggregation space where you can actually play is in the first and the second um if 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 it were up to me i would play in the second part of it uh, which is the technology piece which means giving cloud kitchens the technology they need in order to run their kitchen so there is one company that's doing this it's called pos ist possist i don't know how to pronounce yeah. the name of the yeah. company uh but pos stands for point of sale so they make point of sale uh software for cloud kitchens and in fact they've they've actually expanded a lot more from just a point of sale software uh so there's a lot to do uh because the profits in a cloud kitchen setup are all about how efficient can you be the more efficient you are the more profits you will make so if you can make uh, a software that can help a cloud kitchen even get 10% more efficient that can be a lot of savings for a lot of different cloud kitchens not just software right like anything to do with infrastructure in terms of like how do you lay out the kitchen are there equipments that actually make the things go faster um can you do multiple things can you bake multiple things at all at once can you cook multiple things all at once so trading for that equipment or just having like knowledge about how to set these up and setting up a consultancy that could be a business in itself the idea really is there's this concept of like selling shovels during a gold rush which is basically if there are going to be a lot of cloud kitchens they will need xyz services and instead of figuring out how to run a cloud kitchen if you can figure out how to run how to give these xyz services you're going to end up making a lot of money and we're going to clarify why cloud kitchens itself might not be that great a business model yeah, let's talk about it now right yeah. so the 30% that you were paying for rent earlier um and we spoke to several cloud kitchens about this right uh, we spoke to at least four or five people uh they were they were paying it depends on where you are what kind of restaurant you are have but generally between 15 to 30% of your revenue is going into rent um and you think like oh i save all of that money i'm not paying rent anymore i move to a really cheap place um and I'm, i don't have to pay that expensive high street rent anymore but what in happens instead is you were paying for, uh 25 to 30% for rent but now you're paying 25 to 30% to zomato and swiggy instead so basically your rent has become that uh, the the margins that zomato and swiggy have taken and the problem there is it's not capped at least the rent is capped right you're yeah. saying that hey it's going to be fixed 1 lakh rupee a month but when you're giving 30% to zomato and swiggy let's say you're doing 3 lakhs in revenue you're going to give close to 1 lakh in rent or uh, 1 one lakh in commission fee but even if you go to 4 lakhs and 5 lakhs your commissions are going to keep increasing so you've added this variable cost in your line item which makes profitability extremely difficult so it's both a good and bad thing right yeah. because when you're really small is really good because you don't have a fixed cost but when you're really big you don't want that anymore so what's happening is that there are a couple of cloud kitchens that uh, when they were smaller they were using zomato and swiggy but now they're starting to build out their own delivery fleet 
Um, I'll give you an example, actually. Domino's, I might be wrong about this, in India, they don't pay any um, anything back to Zomato and Swiggy. They don't. Uh, because they're so big, they can actually uh, demand uh, what they want because the demand for Domino's will always be there. And they also have their own delivery fleet. So they can just tell Zomato and Swiggy, like, hey, if you're going to charge me 30%, I'm not working with you. Uh, I'm going to use my own delivery fleet. And there are a few players who have started doing this as well. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, what so if you were to start a cloud kitchen, uh, I'm not saying it's a business that makes absolutely no sense. There are a lot of people who are doing it and doing it right. One way is to go big, right? You raise a lot of capital and then you try to build a pan India brand. And by pan India, you probably just target the metro cities to start with. What that does is you can really now use marketing across different sort of locations, like yeah. do some sort of centralized marketing to make it more efficient and get a lot more orders, even though you're dependent on Swiggy and Zomato to start with, but you're building the brand and maybe you can move some customers um, to your so own sort of sales channel. You're getting economies of scale on marketing. That's yeah. what's happening. So that's so, that's the Rebel Foods model. What's yeah. the second model? The second one is if you want to start something, bootstrap something, you know, just a single store, you can either look at this as an experiment before you actually launch your own physical outlet, right? So this is this is a way, great way to sort of test out on food, test out on like what works, what doesn't work, get customer feedback and all of that. So really get started and then eventually launch your own outlet. That's one way to do about, that's one way to go about it. The second thing that you need to keep in mind, if you're gonna be focused on building a profitable cloud kitchen brand, do not try to compete on biryanis or Indian food or any of that find a niche. We keep saying this on every single episode. It's almost like we have a rule to use the word niche in every single episode, but I'll give you an example. Somebody that I know, somebody that we spoke to actually started a Mexican cloud kitchen in Gurgaon, right? Why is that important? That's important because very less competition. There are only a couple of places that will serve Mexican food and they were able to price the items in a way where that 30%, even with the, even after the 30% goes for commission, you still have a decent profit margin after, after that, right? So 300, 350 bucks, the average order value was around 500 because you would add, add like sauces and guacamole and whatnot. Um, and that that's completely fine because you're targeting a certain niche, but you're keeping the prices high. So you need to do that if you're going to do. So my question, so that's for you is that, if you're a bootstrap entrepreneur who wants to start a cloud kitchen, how much will it cost? Like at the, at the bare minimum. So I think the equipment itself cost about 15 lakhs, if I'm not wrong. This is, this is what we had heard. Um, a lot of what's happening in the market today, because a lot of restaurants shut down in the last year or so, you can get decent quality secondhand equipment, uh, which can reduce your cost significantly. The rent, because you don't have to be at a fancy place, can be anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand rupees uh, per month. Assume no, that not in be, Bombay, not, not in Bombay. Bombay, not in Bombay. Yeah, um, probably more in Bombay. But th the whole point is you have to place it in a way where, sure, it's close to your customers, but it's let's say fourth floor behind back of a building or back of a mall or something like that where the rents are generally cheap, right? Uh, so you have to find some a place like that. So think of think of that as a as as a cost plus six months of security deposit. So um, that's going to be a lakh lakh and a half right there. And then there's a bunch of like depending on you know what your food is, what your raw material costs are. Assume seventy percent of your overall price should be raw material cost, if not if not sort of lesser. Uh, that's a good metric to have, and then price it from there. Okay. If you were to get into the whole cloud kitchen game right now, what would you do? You, what would you do? I honestly won't get into building my own cloud kitchen. Uh, one, I'm not that great with food. I also think it's just just a factory. It's just a small factory in my mind. Uh, and you need to run it as one. I would instead try and do the technology play, um, figure out what kind of technology or equipment or whatnot, just the infrastructure side of things. What do these guys need? to actually run a profitable enterprise, a profitable cloud kitchen. That's what I'm going to focus on. One, one big thing that you can help with, with these um, cloud kitchens is all of them are trying to establish a direct connection with their consumer, right? This is a classic analogy is if you have a physical product, you're selling it on Amazon and you're selling it on your website. Everybody wants to sell it through their website because they, nobody wants to pay commissions to Amazon. 
how can you enable, how can you enable these cloud kitchens to go direct to consumer that's going to be that's a difficult problem to solve for but if you can come up with ideas there i think that's that can be solved but hasn't that already started in, in india where uh, there are these cloud kitchens c l o u t where tiger shroff you you messaged me this the other day where tiger shroff started some kind of a uh, food delivery thing I, i i don't fully remember what it was yeah so so this is this is a different play and i i like this play also right what they're doing is cloud kitchens by itself very hard to stand out very hard to build a brand and all of that what this cloud kitchen did ttsf is the name i don't know the full form ttsf cloud kitchens just google for prowl foods you will get it what they did was they partnered with tiger shroff and said we're going to launch an exclusive line uh um, where tiger shroff is a partner in that sort of food line called prowl foods and and if if people know about tiger shroff he's all about health and fitness and what not so his food like food line is focused around proteins and healthy diet and stuff like that um and they're going to bank off of tiger shroff's brand to now kick start you know the the cloud kitchen business that's a great way to go about it also using an influencer as a partner or partnering with an influencer um that's a great way to do it we spoke about it on one of the podcasts where mr beast who's a youtube sensation in the us started a burger brand overnight 300 locations by partnering with a cloud kitchen and in a month or so ended up selling 3 million units if i'm not wrong some and some that's, ridiculous that's probably like 7 dollars a burger or something yeah so that he sold about 20 million in 3 months of opening which is crazy yeah. yeah it's absolutely crazy but yeah. there there's a huge scope for that like so if you were able to build your own following like a food following of sorts then you could build this kind of cloud kitchen by partnering up with some cloud kitchen and yeah. uh yeah because because the whole part like you said that is marketing is so tough because on these apps getting your name known on these apps is so difficult there are hundreds of restaurants and and i mean for for you to do that you'll have to add like you'd have to do ads so 30% plus the ads all of that right which is where having a physical location while it sounds like fixed rent is you know what like every month i have to give this rent there are inherent benefits if you choose it at the right location all the footfall in and around that location is getting to see your name and is automatically being aware of like something like this exists so they might eventually become a customer right yeah. um so those are some benefits with a physical outlet uh but yeah just to summarize i think go big if you want to do something in this space just raise a lot of capital and go big or uh use this as a stepping stone for your physical outlet or try figure out a niche that can be high end maybe let's say sushi done well on delivery right like figure out packaging uh do high end packaging which is what mexican uh, this mexican restaurant did their packaging was kick ass um so so do something there or the infrastructure play i have three main takeaways from from this episode are we calling this episode i don't know what about this uh from these discussions um three takeaways number 1 restaurants will either focus on efficiency or experience so like you said siddharth right uh, either scale up or keep it small but really focus on experience make that packaging really really good number 2 uh low margins and therefore scale matters so uh, unless you're you're able to sell your products expensive like the mexican place we uh, we spoke about uh, is usually going to be a low margin business so that means scale matters to a certain extent and number 3 uh support products might be a better play uh, than the actual cloud kitchen so support products we mean those saas products the software products or even if you can become a consultant to make the restaurant more efficient or whatever uh getting into the whole support role might be better um uh, from the people we have spoken to right now the t- the the metros have been saturated by cloud kitchens but it's now starting to go into the tier 2 and tier 3 cities as well it's still not saturated in those locations and it's happening slowly yeah. so eventually a place like indore might see its first cloud kitchen but not yet uh but uh cloud kitchens is a really really interesting trend um i remember a year ago i was super super hyped about starting my own cloud kitchen i was like oh my god cloud kitchens must be amazing uh as i dug into it a bit more it's not as great as i thought but it's not that bad of a business either um any business has inherent risk and cloud kitchens also have that risk uh you need to be not you need you should not be afraid of marketing yourself if you make a cloud kitchen because if you don't spend money on marketing you will not be seen you will not be able to survive 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's our rant about cloud kitchens. So please comment below if you like what you hear. Please subscribe and hit that notify button so that you know when our next video comes up. Thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Yeah.